Thank you, Chrissy. Again, I'm Maura Savage. Um, I'm a clinical social worker and I uh, want to spend a little bit of time kind of talking about this journey that you've all been on. Um, you know, my first step, I know that we're here with child survivors and you're worried about your kids, but uh, the first thing I want to acknowledge is that you all are survivors. Um, you have done this. You've brought your child through this. You brought your family through this, um, and there's times I think we as parents suppress that down or don't think about that and run around, and I think, you know, you deserve a little time reflecting on what your journey has been, um, and I strongly believe in those. How many of you flew to get here? Anybody take an airplane? What's that? Put on your mask first to better assist the person next to you. I, you know, I think as parents, you have to remember that adage. You've got to put your oxygen mask on first to better assist your kids in getting theirs on in, in that survivorship. So survival quite simply begins when you're told you have cancer or any life-threatening diagnosis and continues the rest of your life. Okay, so we we enter the world and remain as this identity of, of survivorship. Um, and again, I truly think to figure out where we're going, we need to know where we've been. I started my career as a history major way back when. I, I like the historical perspective. Um, and kind of contrary to, to other things, I think the very worst time to do therapy is when you're in the middle of a crisis. And I, I love people in Transplant Center that say, they need to go into therapy. And my answer is, when do they have time? We, we can't do this. So you spend those years, right, kind of girding your ego strength and girding your energy and, and girding what little emotional extra you have, right? And it's not till it's all over, and I've had many parents who come to me 12 months, 6 months after they go through that, sometimes years after, and go, I think there's something wrong with me. I'm supposed to be happy, but I'm not. And all of a sudden, I'm not sleeping, or I'm not able to cope, or I'm having nightmares. Well, you know what? At some point, this experience has to be dealt with. Again, your mask first. We're going to get to your kids' masks and your siblings' masks in a little bit. But to understand that that's very normal and it's a process that has to keep working through at different times. And it is when you are away from the crisis that you have some psychological energy to really process what you went through. Um, and it's quite remarkable. You know, at the beginning, if I told you this is what you're going to do, this is what's going to happen, uh, you'd look at me like I was crazy and run away, right? If we really kind of said from the beginning, you'd also probably say, I would never be able to do that. Um, my, my favorite quote, I've, all wisdom comes from, from you all as parents. Favorite quote uh, a mother told me once in a support group was, I hate when people tell me, I don't know how you do it. Because that implies a choice, right? Who would choose it? Would you choose this? Absolutely not. But you're a parent, so you just have to. Um, so that was that was her least favorite line. I gave the we had an open support group of what drives you crazy of what people say. So we got all the all the famous quotes, but that was definitely the top one. So to kind of let's just quickly run through the flashback here. Um, how many were transplanted for non oncological conditions, non cancer? Okay. Would just Okay. HLH? Okay. So for most cases, there was some type of acute diagnosis. Um, you know, some of our lifelong illnesses now treated with transplants sort of have a different path. But that crisis point, right, of finding out, oh, my God, there's something wrong. Um, so little lightning bolts. This, by the way, is a social worker's version of a roadmap. We came up with this one day because, you know, in cancer, everything's a roadmap and all those like little blocks that you got when you started this journey. Uh, social workers, we like to think in circles and things like that. So this is our roadmap. Uh, myself and one of my colleagues had put this together. So you, you start on this road, um, the diagnosis. Who would have known that you'd know the language you know, right? I always say we need diplomas at the end. Uh, I, when I tell a parent, six months from now, you're going to be coming in, you're going to be telling me about counts, you're going to be telling me about this number and that number. I mean, it's quite remarkable what you've done. So give yourself credit for that. And at the beginning, look at all those faces. Wasn't the whole world there at the beginning? Right? So many people coming out, so many people doing that. Um, 
but the road kind of continues. A lot of curves in this road, not a lot of straight ahead things. Uh, for specifically for chemotherapy treatment, we, we have hair loss, we have all the side effects. Um, big potholes along this road, that's what those little pictures are on the graphic, are potholes, financial issues, right? The world doesn't stop. Feels like the world should stop when your child's sick, right? The world should just shut down for a year. But, got to pay your mortgage, you've got to worry about that, we've got to worry about work. Um, hopefully you had some detours. Hopefully there were some rest stops along the way and some roadside assistance. Uh, hopefully you met some of these folks along the way, so maybe some social workers, child life specialists, your dietitian, school, physical therapy. Hopefully those, those folks came. Um, and then, you know, this is my, my general map. We've got some, we've got some dark tunnels on this road. And as you journey there, you know, probably thinking about this, um, you know, is it relapse? Are you faced with treatment choices? Is it transplant or is it only transplant? You got no choice. Let's go. You know, and all the all those choices that you made. Um, what I like to say to you as parents is, you made the best choice because you made it with everything you knew at that time. I'm sure you made it with great love and concern and probably a heck of a lot of stress. Um, and I know as parents, we like to sit up at night and say, if I knew, would I have done this? You know, if, if, if this, then that. Um, but I think you, you all have to sit in the place you are and say, you know what? You did, you did what you did. Um, and here we are. And then we get some of these curves. We've got some limited vision. You know, step off and, and reflect that. Uh, death of your child or death of other children. Um, Probably as a very young social worker way back a million years ago, the biggest revelation for me in talking to parents was in bringing up talking about death, I was not introducing a new concept, right? I was giving voice probably to fears that were there. I don't think you can walk into any pediatric treatment facility, push those doors open that say cancer center treatment center and not have that fear in you. Okay, so that's a nightmare that stays with us. Our kids get better, our kids heal, but there's this very dark place in you that you've lived through. But what, again, what I'd like to point out is you've survived and you're out on the other side of this tunnel. Um, sibling coping. We're going to talk a lot about that as we go. Oh, this road keeps going. You should see, I have, a, I, I have this chart, and I can lay this out. I had somebody publish me a big poster, and it just goes around the walls on here. You get on that circle, right? When will this ever end? And probably, guess what? I was listening to you all with Dr. Horan. We're still talking about that, right? What do we do? We're worrying about the future. We're worrying about these things. Here we go. Um, you're, on this, you're on this journey. So I think in some places trying to come to terms with the fact that this is, this is our new normal. This is how we live. So how do we take what we have? How do we reorder our family and live? Um, you know, waiting for the results, waiting, waiting, waiting. Um, you sit in the waiting room with lots of people who sit on that road, that road of remission, that road of relapse, um, because it's not just – it's not just you and your child. It's all those little kids that you've played with in the waiting room. It's all the same parents you've shared coffee with over time. You kind of, you know, the clinical word for it is vicarious traumatization. It's a big word to say you're kind of sharing a lot of people's other pain when maybe you don't have a time and energy to share that pain. But that's definitely part of the childhood cancer experience. Adults are great. Adults can keep to themselves. Have you ever sat in an adult cancer center? You know, so... Everybody just says, kids, we can't do that because they're on tricycles and they're running around. And, you know, kids just get into each other's business naturally and drag their parents into that. Um, and then, you know, here we come onto this road, recovery, questions of problems at school, coming back for checkups. Um, you know, that scanxiety that everybody still has. You come in, doesn't matter how many years you're out, you got scanxiety. Kids have that as they come through. So... I like conceptual framework, right? So this is kind of how I look at this. I think when we talk about survival, just like that first slide says, it starts from the day 
you step foot into your first diagnostic conference with a doctor, right? You're, you're starting on the road to survival. The first phase is that acute survival. That's the part that you, you may or may not have. Either some people have such wicked, vivid memories of that that they stay with them, or it's a giant blur tied to a lot of very intense emotion, right? It's that first couple of months of remembering to put your pants on in the morning, remembering to, you know, find your car in the parking lot. Um, hopefully you had a social worker come along and tell you, you know, did you eat today? You know, have you done that? Where we, we have to remember to ask those kind of questions. Okay? That's your acute survival. You can't stay like that. Right? We could live on adrenaline for a long time. I think if I asked you all about your sort of diagnosis story, you're going to tell me that you lived for several weeks on very little sleep, very little anything else. I see lots of it's making sense. I think I see a lot of people remembering that. But again, you'll, you'll fall over, right? So what we have to do is move into extended survival. So extended survival is active treatment, that day-to-day -day figuring out that routine. When your car can make it into the parking lot in the dark by yourself, you know, you close your eyes and you realize, how did I, how did I get to the hospital already? Uh, where you learn the names of all those drugs. You start talking in terms you never thought you'd talk to before. Um, things that you never thought you could handle. You know, uh, how many times being thrown up on or saying that and, and watching your children do that. That's, that's that extended survival and figuring out you could do it, right? Then we move to where you are now and it's permanent survival. Um, you're not out of the woods. And I think the, um, my roadmap was abbreviated a little bit. I took out some of the slides on it because one of the other things was the question of remember all those little people on there? A couple slides down, I've got one that says, where did everybody go? You know, have you gotten that yet? Aren't you over this yet? You're still going to that hospital? Didn't your kid get your, your kid had cancer how long ago? Okay, so you've got to incorporate this experience into your life. And wouldn't it be great if we just had time to sit and talk to each other and figure it out for ourselves? But that's not your job, right? Your job is to help figure it out for your kids. Um, but I do think, I think it's very important. This, these are my quick slides at the beginning, but it really is to acknowledge, while this talk is not about parental survival, um, you know, put that, put that mask on yourself. Revisit it at different times. Um, you know, this is an interesting weekend to talk about survival, right? It, it, the anniversary of 9-11. Um, I was standing in an oncology clinic when I watched the planes. I don't know if any of you were also in an oncology clinic. Um, I had a brother who was working in the World Trade Center, and I grew up in New Jersey. And, you know, you think you make sense of things, right? You, you list through. Um, yesterday, my um, undergraduate alumni program listed the names of all the people again. And I couldn't, I was so surprised at my own reaction. You know, things you think that you've dealt with, even something like that. And again, it was a little abstract. I mean, it affected me. My, my brother was fine, thank God. But that moment, but living through it, those surprises. And I think people are having that reaction. And I'd like to say, we, we talked about what should we do for all the families at the hospital when that happens? Should we have a group? Should we talk to the kids? I had one mom in the infusion room, and we we're sort of asking about how everybody was doing. She's like, yeah. I know that's going on there, but I've got my own terrorist attack going on right here. I, I can't think about that. So I think there's a lot of parallels to this national reflection on the anniversary of 9-11 and sort of that broad tragedy to your individual ones. And at different times, maybe you, you think about your child's limitations or they ask you a question, and things can be going great for months, but you'll have moments of that understand that it's normal, it's okay, and it's okay to talk about. Find people that it's okay to talk about. You know, not the ones that say, oh, she's still talking about that cancer. Those are people to go have a cup of coffee with and do something. Don't, don't try to, if you know you're not going to get that response, but find somebody. It's an okay response, okay? That's my, I want to write out permission slips for all of you to, to say, you don't get over it. Try to make sense of it. You try to integrate it. But it still, it becomes a part of you. And in the best way, it changes your core being into strength because you've done it. You remembered to put your pants on that morning. You remembered to brush your hair. I always, you know, I remember, I always point to Beverly. I remember Beverly at New Diagnosis. My first line for you know, your first week of treatment is you get points for getting up out of bed and brushing your hair. You get points. We'll make a chart, a sticker chart for you for that. 
Okay, so what does the literature tell us? End point, crisis is sometimes an end point. People think, oh, we're supposed to be happy when we come off treatment. And when did you ever come off treatment with transplant, right? When you graduate from your treatment center? Was that a happy feeling when you said, when the treatment team said you're not going to come back to your treatment center? <laughs> Please let me come for one more visit. Please don't send me away, right? And people go, yay, you don't have to go there. No, you don't understand. It's like a, it's like a security blanket being taken away. Um, this is, this is anxiety. So sort of remembering that. So hopefully this is, if nothing else, this is normalizing anything that's happened. Um, the medication and attention of treatment team provides a routine and a structure for support. Okay? We all want our kids off steroids. They're mean. They're very, you know, <laughs> they're, they're kind of, Things get better. They grow. Who was in here before asking, will they grow? They will grow, but it takes a while. But when you come off of them, what's going to happen to graft versus host disease? What's going to do that? So, you know, these are these are crisis points. Um, as I talked about at the beginning, exit from treatment or movement from treatment, because, again, as we know, we're not really ever exiting one thing, can rekindle feelings that have been suppressed. Um and you may feel like you don't belong in the world of the sick or the world of the healthy. You know, you go back home and you, you view the world really differently. You know, people are silly, aren't they? Um, I even find, and again, I've, I've not been tested by the fire you've been tested with. I've just, I've just walked next to you for a while. Um, people can annoy me. You know, pe people who, who have these silly worries and you're like, please, you want, you want something to worry about? You know, let me tell you something. You can't do that. Okay. So, but your child's well, right? You're not in that treatment center. You're not sharing that intensity. And in some ways, you know, the parents who are in that, that prospect, you're somewhere else. So you're in this state of limbo. Um, and there's a lot of work to do. We really disrupted your lives for a couple of years during active treatment, didn't we? we? We messed things up good. We say, you must stay at the hospital. We don't care that there's other kids at home. We, don't, we do care, but what we care about, our focus, of course, is your child from there. Um, Reestablishing family and peer relationships. All right. What is not developmentally normal? Um, you know, take a... 16-year-old male patient, put them in a, I never, I'm never good with, I have no spatial relations, what would be the dimension of a hospital room? 12 by 12 box, right? <laughs> I should go measure one. Did, did anybody measure one you know, while you were there to say how long I'm in that space? With his mother, or a teenage girl, take any adolescent, and their mother in a room for two months. Is this developmentally appropriate? Okay, what's supposed to be happening in that period, right? Children are supposed to be individuating. They're supposed to be moving on. Parents are supposed to be. We, we messed that up. Take a two-year-old. Put them in the 10 by 10 room or the 12 by 12 room. What are two-year-olds supposed to be doing? Crawling on the floor, picking up things, exploring, telling you no, right? No, 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 no. Um, and what do we say? Mm -mm. Um, doing invasive things. Right? They're supposed to be doing things for themselves. You know, we take that away. So coming out of that, we really need to rethink what, what developmentally is supposed to be going on here. Um, you know, and, and as parents, our desire to shelter, protect, nest them, um, you know, is there ways to sort of push them out into the world a little bit? Um, so kind of thinking, where is your child? What are peers doing? Know that there's this chasm. What's a healthy way to gain entrance back to that world? And as parents, where even though where you're feeling lost, saying, I don't feel in the world of the well, I don't feel in the world of the sick, your focus is going to be on how do we set up small successes? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And we don't want to just push them out there and say, hey, you're on your own. Go, go navigate adolescent relationships. Okay? But how do we as parents deliberately set up experiences, you know, latency age kids, you miss third and fourth grade. How do you reenter at fifth grade? Um, that's a tough, any of those ages are tough. We can pick any, any age. Um, Reestablishing roles within the family. 
Um, you know, a lot of times, maybe previously, we've seen um, the mother may be the primary caregiver. Uh, we had this, this teenage girl. She was an older teenager. Her father was a big CEO type, traveled most of his career, uh, very successful, but was offered early retirement, coinciding with her need to be in the hospital. Mom, who was the primary kind of caregiver for this child but worked, had really good health insurance. What a huge switch. So this poor guy who was used to being a CEO, what a bad place to put a CEO in the middle of a children's hospital. You, know, you can't be the boss of much of anything. And with a strong-willed teenage girl, he wasn't the boss of very much at all. That was a difficult challenge for him, a sweet man, but also for him and his daughter. They had to navigate this whole new relationship. And then when you come out, where's that other parent? So, um, you know, as you're working on your child's relationships, you and your partner, spouse, if you've been a single parent, if you're trying to navigate dating again, right, you're going to have to reestablish all of those new relationships, resuming normal developmental tasks. Um, you sleep in the bed with your child. You know, my kids in the hospital, I climb into bed with them. They're 14, seven years after treatment. That's probably developmentally not okay. Um, so how do, you, how do you resume some of those roles? Um, redefining self, you know, for, for your child, for the siblings. Um, how do you guide them to be protect, the productive members of the community? Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about some of these things. And for our young adult survivors, how do you secure medical coverage? Okay, I, was, I came in, for those of you who were in the last talk with Dr. Horan, you know, in asking about services for survivors, one of our biggest things is, yeah, there's great prescribed tests. But who pays for them? You know, there's definitely some lobbying and insurance issues for our survivors of treatment to say they need that. You know, why does a 21-year-old need an echocardiogram? That's reserved for 45-year-olds with high blood pressure. No, our cancer survivors need this. So some of that is that advocacy piece and getting funding for that. Um, talking about reactions, okay, modulating like I said, you know, we're clearly on the reflective weekend of anniversary reactions of a, of a large national tragedy. I think you all have had large personal bombs go off in your living rooms. So dates pop up. Little things will hit you. They, they will do that with your child, too. So kind of needing to tune into their being in that. Uh, fear of relapse. Okay. Um, there is nobody more protective of you than your child. There's nobody more worried about you, even when they're acting the fool, right, than your child. So they're not necessarily going to come right out and, and say, am I going to relapse? Some kids will. Some kids will. But a lot of times if kids start asking questions and keeping that open-ended dialogue, a lot of times they're going to test for a reaction and see how open you are to those questions. And they can be subtle. Kids can be sneaky, right? Um, starting to ask about that experience. And sometimes for parents, those, those memories are painful. And we might not be ready to talk about them with the kids. So again, put your mask on first. You've got to kind of steal yourself for, you know, is this going to come back? Why did you do this to me? Why am I not normal? Okay. My, my simple advice, right? Everything I say sounds easy, right? In reality, it's really hard. I always think with children's questions, what's the emotion behind the question? Okay, what, what are they really kind of asking? What are they afraid of? And beginning to try to help them get to that um, will maybe help in that dialogue. Uh, validate feelings regarding fears and reactions. Okay? Just like I'm telling you, it's normal for you to have flashbacks on this. It's normal. Now, if they get invasive in your life, you need to seek some outside assistance. Okay, That's kind of the line. When does it interfere? A couple nights lost sleep, you're going to survive. But if you find you're going a month and you can't sleep, well, and intrusive thoughts, it's time for you to get help. Same with your child. Are they having night terrors? Are they having... Um, 
all of a sudden they're having trouble at school. Okay, don't rule out the top thing might not be the transplant. It might be something else. But to say even five years out, six years out, kids can have a trauma reaction to this. Um, actually, there's a study that was just done out of Dana-Farber looking at PTSD in bone marrow transplant survivors. And it's probably there more than we think it is. Um, and, again, this doesn't mean that you need, you need to take all your children into uh, into therapy right now. But I think acknowledging that, working it through, being aware of these things, um, and helping your child with that. And, again, we're, we'll get to some techniques. Is it published? It is. It is. It, it was published about two months ago. I want to say Fong is the author. And I can I can find that link and get it through Pat Haber um, or wherever to get it out on BMT Infinite. But um, it's, it's very recently published. Um, somebody forwarded me a copy ahead of this saying, make sure you mention this to people. It's, it's new research. You know, I think it's different. Um, getting to some of the I'm kind of uh, I have it I have it in here, but we'll get we'll get to it. Um, so I think it affects everybody, and I think that everybody remembers everything, but they remember it differently. Um, I remember several years ago. We had a child come to clinic who had been treated for cancer, did not have a transplant, but had invasive chemotherapy, and really was angry that they had to come. They didn't understand why they were coming to this clinic, why they were doing this, and, and was having real anger outbursts years after treatment. And what we did was we sat down and we retaught them their disease, got the child life specialist to do a new diagnosis teaching, just as, as we would do. And, and from that, we kind of learned that periodically, particularly little kids, need to be retaught what went on. And I think the natural tendency is to protect children and not talk about it um, in, a lot of, in a lot of cases. You know, like they, they won't do that. Just say, what do you remember? Can you tell me? And when I, I, I for a period of time, was the social worker and survivor clinic. I think I've been the social worker everywhere in the Hemonc world. Um, that was always my question to kids in survivor clinic. Tell me your story. Tell me what you remember. And the little ones are fascinating. The little neuroblastoma babies who start at, you know, two, get transplanted, keep coming back. You know, they're, they're coming back at six and seven to say, tell me. And it's amazing. And even the parents are shocked. We have one kid, the red tricycle. There was a red tricycle. I'm like, mm -hmm, there was. What else? Um, and let them, you know, as there's the slide further down talking about, let them retell their story. They have to continue to make sense of it. Um, so little people will make sense of it differently at different times in their life. Um, I'm actually a, a big fan of photos through treatment, probably when it's the hardest time to take pictures of your kids and you don't want to do that, um, and even coming back to clinic because that's their story. And kids love to tell their story. You know, they're... They begin to integrate it into who they are. And the same message that I give to you, you can give to your kids. Look what you've done. You can be really proud of this. You know, so this becomes something, this becomes a good badge for, for kids, building self-confidence in children. We don't want them so self-confident that they're, you know, running across the street, right? We, but to do that and let them, when you come back to your clinic, when you're only coming once a year, you know, you can even start a couple days before. Do you do remember this? Um, sometimes those memories become morphed. They start telling the story you've told. So you get an opportunity to shape that story. But for them, they'll have some very vivid memories. And it's so interesting what, what's remembered. Sometimes it's pajamas. Sometimes it's pain. Um, sometimes it's bad-tasting medicine. Um, but usually along with that, there's bad-tasting medicine, and then there's, you know, funny pajamas or there's something. Their, their little brains are very interesting in that. Um, and I think letting them retell that story is going to give a, a different picture to it because it is going to be a part of who they are. Older kids have to get through. They've got a lot more cognitive knowledge of what's going on. Depending on where they are in their emotional development, 
how they're going to integrate that into their emotional being. Um, you know, certainly survivorship issues for our late adolescents are, do you, do you self-disclose to somebody you're dating? Um, when you go away to college, I had one girl, her whole, actually it was kind of interesting, her whole life identity was, I am Margie, girl with cancer. She was like the poster child. She, she survived three relapses. She was beautiful. She did all kinds of activities. She was the face for, you know, fundraisers and things like that. And that, for good or for bad, that became who she was. And she went to college, and I, I met her as she came back for a visit um, when she'd been away. And it was kind of like I'm not special. I'm my freshman year in college, and I'm not special. And it's like, well, it's up to you now. You can be the girl with cancer. You can be whatever you want. You know, what are you going to tell your dorm mates? Fertility, things like that. So it's it's a story that needs to be retold at different developmental ages, from little people all the way up through, and let them kind of retell the effect of that. Um, What do we see with our kids? Um, We see a lot of times an emotional maturity well beyond their peer group. Right. Um, They're kind of wise children. Uh, They have some social anxiety. They've been out of school for a couple of years. They may have difficulty identifying with peers. Um, They have emotional changes, physical factors. Their body may have changed. And not all things are bad. Right. They have an intense affiliation with their family. Um, So and we as parents, we're part of that. We're wrapped in that. So part of it is our recognition of we need to push them out into the world a little bit. Um, Psychological adjustments. These are some steps that that kids have to go through, kind of incorporate. Feelings of loss. Now, those little, the little ones are not going to remember their neighbor next door who didn't survive treatment or they didn't do that. Um, But our, our, even our early cognitive six, seven, eight year olds, um, you know, guilt for having survived. Why, why did I live and they didn't? This is kind of a deep thing. Loss of abilities, life prospects, skills, body parts, you know, functional things. So these are all things we need to incorporate into kind of understanding for them. Uh, they may <laughs> engage in risk-taking behaviors. Maybe as simple as going out without their sunscreen. Um, down to, I'm invincible. If I survive this man, I'm going to survive anything. That adolescent. Um, so you may find that they go from being, some will be so far up under, you know, we have these kids who will never leave home, and then we have the other ones who are like, woohoo! Um, I did have one person come back again years ago with a baby and said, I thought you all told me I could never get pregnant. It's like, ooh, never believe everything we say. Um, so risk-taking behaviors, self-esteem and self-perception problems, and post-traumatic stress disorder symptom. Um, you know, so what do we do about these things? First is promoting mastery and self-confidence. I think as parents, we've got to think in small, achievable successes. Okay? Setting your child up to win is what you need to do. Um, I think children need to continually be pushed and challenged with a whole lot of love, but allowed to succeed. Um, you know, convincing a kid who's just out of the hospital that, yeah, of course you can go out for soccer. It's a competitive team. No problem if you want to do that. I'll let them do whatever they want. And then they fail, and they don't get picked for the team. Not setting your child up for success. Maybe finding a program that they can do that. Maybe helping them find a niche to do that. What what are their interests? What are their strengths? Let's capitalize on their strengths. Um, and this is great for, for any child. This is This is good for siblings. This is good for families who have unaffected by illness. Um, Coming to terms with any physical appearance issues. Okay, if you have GVHD of the scan. Um, We're really going to have to work on, and the world is, I think the other message is, you know what? You've lived in an oncology clinic where everybody has loved you, and nobody looks at you funny. The world's going to look at you funny. That's, That's the reality. That's the painful world of the human race. So it's giving 
giving our kids the skills to deal with that and maybe anticipating that. Role play is great. So before they go back to school, again, setting them up for success. You know, and as, has anybody, have you found that anybody kind of looks at you? You know, ask them that. And they may say, you may be shocked to know that they've noticed that for a long time. Uh, or not to say, well, what, you know, what should we do about that? Um, you know, how do you, how do you feel with that? And to acknowledge, you know, that hurts. I don't like it either. Um, dealing with, with bullying. That's the way to do that. Role play that with your child. Let them practice, again, so they have mastery and they feel success. Social acceptance. Finding places where they do fit in. Um, you know, finding places that, that are a little safer to start with. Maybe it's if you belong to a, a church. Maybe it's a church youth group that you know the leader and you kind of can coach the kids to say, be nice and don't stare when they first come out of the hospital. Right? And they can learn to practice those social skills. A little more controllable environment as they stretch into a broader environment. Um, attainable and realistic goals. You know, our, our kids with chronic GVHD of the joints are not going to be NBA basketball stars. They're just not. That's not an attainable goal. So, but what will be? They could do a whole lot of other things. What can you do? You, are, you know so much. You are so strong from this experience. What else are you interested in? Um, and competence and resilience. Okay. Um, what do you do? You listen and accept. We're good at that. Right? The problem is sometimes we want to try to fix. We jump right to the fix instead of letting them talk and talk and talk. So sometimes I'm bad at that with my own son. Right? I want to fix everything. I'm a social worker. And that's what I do. Just listen. Praise efforts and progress. Okay? Instead of that generalist, you're so wonderful, go to the way you handled that situation, the way you said this, wasn't that great? Don't you feel good about that? Go to the very specific behavior. Helps them kind of clue into what's, what's successful. Uh, realistic feedback in a positive way. The world's not perfect. We're not going to be able to stop everybody. We're not going to be able to stop people from looking in the supermarket. Um, identify strengths and abilities, and that's really the biggest thing. Partner with teachers. Sometimes we don't see our kids, we see our kids so wonderfully, um, or we may see, not see an interest that they have. Talk to people who interact with your child. What do you think they do well? You know, really nurture that in them. Talk to them. Um, set reasonable standards. Offer choices and allow each child to contribute. Um, the other warning I give you, Lord, did we create some monsters, didn't we? But I get a toy every time I do something. But I get 50,000 presents for doing that. Um, and those are hard habits to break, and, and they're going to be miserable. Um, also, that I don't feel well, and I don't want to go to school. Do they really not feel well? Do they not want to go to school? Um, remember that when you're trying to make behavior change in children, the rule of behavior, pick one to work on at a time, not everything. The behavior you pick on will get worse before it gets better. Right? This is the theory of behavior. It accelerates. They're going to test you. They're going to scream for 20 minutes. If you give in at 20, guess what? Next time it will be 22. They'll keep screaming. So one of, that's why you pick one behavior at a time because it takes a lot of energy to change that. Um, setting back chores, setting back what's normal in your family. Kids want the family life to go back to normal. When things are completely off whack, they go, something must really be wrong with me. They're not telling me something. You know, I'm still being able to do whatever I want to do. Something still must be wrong, and it's very unsettling. Okay, so helping children with trauma reactions. These are those flashbacks. These are those night terrors, that moment. Um, physical soothing, touch. One of the tough things in transplant is, uh, you know, what, what I find very hard is the lack of physical touch and soothing at times. When kids are only being touched through gloves, um, when there's times you can't pick them up and hold them, or they can't get up and do that, um, it hurts to get a big old bear hug. Okay, so even our big kids, you know, even our even our 20 year olds. They still need their heads stroked. They need to be touched. And even years out where you think 
gosh, my, my child is sort of beyond that. Being very physical with them. Because also, kids have to relearn after transplant that physical touch is not painful. That's, that's a tough one. Um, so even, you know, down to swaddling in a blanket and watching TV with your big old 12-year-old, you know, if they're, if they're up for it, if they're feeling in that kind of vulnerable mood, um, be open to physicality for that. Um, intentionally stroke and touch. Do you notice that you, you still have a kid that startles when people touch them? Okay. Some of that you're going to have to deliberately overcome. There are people who will still startle. That's a trauma reaction from touch. Write a story if that's their thing. Tell the story. Tell it over and over again. The slide I was looking for. Um, the power of the narrative. Let them tell and retell their story. Um, do any of you familiar with Beads of Courage? Do you use them at your facility? The beads. That's the purpose of that. I mean, that's a wonderful tool to say this is my visual story. And let them retell. Let them show that. I mean, that's a... That's a warrior badge. That's a that's a very intense thing to say. This is for this, and this, and I've seen like three year olds be able to tell me what their beads are for. That's telling their story, making sense of it. Um, positive expressions of anger. Okay, if you're having someone's having a, having anger outbursts, there's definitely some intervention. There's some things that are not okay. Kicking you, hitting you, hitting their brother, hitting their sister. It's not okay. Smashing a window when you're older. These are not okay. Uh, I know you're angry, and this is a session we can do for, you know, hours talking about how to deal with angry. Sometimes in a mad corner, having a place that you can go if you're feeling mad, you can throw pillows, you can throw your stuffed animals, you can throw this in this section where nothing's going to hurt. That's your mad place. It's safe. Get it out. But no, you're not going to do it at the dinner table. No, you're not going to hurt the dog. No, you're not going to hurt your mom. Um, and structuring that. Um, structure play to recreate and communicate about the trauma. Um, and again, this is straight out of trauma literature, so you can take this and apply it to other difficult situations. Um, and again, that's, that's kind of retelling that. Um, you know, a therapist with young kids will use dolls and, and play for that. And seek professional help as needed. Um, and if you have a bad experience with a therapist the first time, look again. Talk to people at your at your treatment center. See if they have better. Because, uh, you know, it is about a fit. And there are people who don't understand illness with our kids. So it's it's don't let one experience kind of do that. Um, I'm going to skip over educational issues just because that's a whole other slide. I'm available to talk about that for the next bit. I'm around, but I'm getting cued that we're, we're short on time here. Um, all right, so all these scary things I'm telling you, right? You know what? It's good, too. The other thing literature tells us, studies tell us, and your kids tell us, good things happen. Tremendous personal growth of the whole family. Siblings. Um, you know what? Siblings of sick kids, who kids have been sick, what fields they're most likely to go into? Helping professions. Teaching, medicine, social work. Um, our siblings are great. Okay, they've got a tough time, and, and again, the time has gone short, so we've talked a little bit less about that, but they can have those trauma. Let them tell their story. They're a part of this. Include them back in. Reintegrate with them when you get home. Um, confidence to meet future challenges. Our kids can do this. They can do anything. There is nothing that's going to get in their way. You know? Cancer, schmancer. Transplant, transplant. They're going to do it. Um, increased empathy. They're kind children. They still may go through their mad place. They go to their mad corner because they, they got some anger to work out, but they tend to have great empathy. Um, siblings also. More committed to life's goals. Okay? They're not silly, frivolous kids. You know, they're pretty straightforward. Um, intensified family intimacy. You know, it's, that's, that's a double-edged sword, right? That's very stressful when you go through in marital relationships and family relationships. But you know what? You weather that, it's an amazing thing. You get a gift to be in a place with your child with that much intensity, with that much time. Very few parents have had that opportunity to be that intimate with their child. Um, take that as a gift and grow with that as they get better. Um, professional relationships. 
their exposure to a broader world. You know, they, they are aware of so much. Um, they've met doctors and nurses and different people and scientists and lab people. Um, a whole view of life's choices, um, you know, of what they can be, what they can do. An acquired outlook on life, right? This idea of don't let the, don't sweat the small stuff anymore. Um, a lot of times our, our kids don't get caught up in some of the nonsense of middle school, some of the drama of, you know, that, that adolescent phase because, hey, that's not important. Um, and interest in contributing to the welfare of others. You know, giving back, doing that. They, they are fascinating kids. They're interesting. They grow up to be tremendous adults. So the goal, integrate the transplant experience into who they are without letting it define who they are. Become Maggie, the, the funky, interesting kid with all this stuff who had cancer, not Maggie, the girl with cancer. Okay? It's part of them. It won't go away. It will be a part of their life definition. But let them tell their story from little people all the way up. Um, they, they're going to have to make sense of it at different times. Reteach it developmentally as they get older. Um, as you're getting there, maintain an, an image of the future. Set goals. Monitor their growth and development, all that good stuff. Baseline assessments. You know, that's neuropsych testing, that's bed psych testing. Remediate to gain necessary skills. Um, and monitor their, their psychosocial functioning. You know, kind of keeping an eye out. Are they, do they have friends? Do they have, it's always, again, at my, after Tell Me Your Story, it's who do you play with at school? That's always my next question in a kid's assessment. First thing, who do you play with? Who do you sit with at lunch? Great question. Now, do you have friends? Oh, yeah, I have friends. Well, who do you sit with at lunch? That, that sort of defines where their little world is. And then I leave you with the thought of, for those who fight for it, life has a flavor the sheltered never know. Right? It's a juicy gift. You've, you've, it's hard and it's awful, but out of that come fascinating, interesting beings. So how does this all hit you? Thoughts? Questions? So I think we know that stress affects our overall well-being. Yes. Um, I don't think there's any link that stress creates childhood cancer. Childhood cancers are developmental cells and things like that, but certainly anybody's well-being is affected by stress. Um, Part of that is helping them come up, and, and with little kids in general, come up with that language because they don't have it yet. And maybe identify it for them. You look mad. You look, you know, I love Facebook. I love those, the, no, now you say Facebook, right? And it's, it's there. Facebook with different, you know, emotions, angry, sad. This helping kids identify, you know, even those little baby books that are just a picture of the face. And uh, my poor child, you know, as a child of a social worker, when he was a baby, I'm like, you know, look at emotion. Let's identify faces. And helping them kind of put their emotions. Have one of those books. Show me what you feel. A mad chart. Ooh. You know, oh, that's angry. What are you going to do about that? You know, let them teach them that emotional language, just like you teach language about the world, right? When you have real little ones, uh, tree. Yeah, oh, flower. You know, you listen to a mom and a child or a dad and a child. It's You're just constantly giving words. You look happy today. What happened today? You know, you look scared. Are you scared? You know, what, what's going on? And let them, give them a language to do that. Give them a place to kind of get that out. And they're going to have to kind of work to that. Um. There are critical years. We kind of skipped over the, the educational slide. There are critical years at which acquire where learning disabilities in general appear. Um, certainly, entry to school, entry to school, kindergarten is the first place kids are seen and assessed coming in. Um, then places where kind of curriculum and learning changes. Third and fourth grade is sort of the next catch. That's actually where a lot of kids with dyslexia or language disabilities are picked up because the the uh, requirements are different. The way you're the way you're processing information. Next level is somewhere between kind of fifth and sixth grade. So when you're looking at late effects and things like that, a lot of those are very specific acquired processing problems. 
So it may be that, that those appear, your child may be coasting along in school fine, um, but complex mathematical computation might be it. And that's what neuropsychological testing does. It looks at very specific um, processing patterns, and we know that neurocognitive difficulty, it doesn't, it's not a reflection of intelligence. Um, it's more an acquired specific processing disability. So I skipped over that education slide, but also just to sort of be aware as you all are navigating this world, if your child was treated in early school age, there may be times that you, that you may need to do accommodations. It might be in high school. It might be that we find that memory issues were fine up until that point, until the demand is so much greater for memory that you need some accommodations for that. Uh, somebody reading the SATs to your child. So keep that, just file that back in that file cabinet somewhere with everything else you're getting this weekend to file away. Um, first thing you want to do is, well, there's, there's two things I would say first. One very practical one else. I'll start with the less practical. Uh, or the very practical would be pull your insurance panel and start with that. See if there's somebody on your panel that's good. If not, and consider working off of that, but kind of two ways. Specifically look first, do they, do they deal with children of the age of your child? A lot of generalist people will say, oh, I'll dip down to a 14-year-old, but I mostly do adults. If your child is much younger than that, you really want somebody with knowledge of pediatrics um, or of, of young kids, um, people who do um, play therapy. Um, so there's things that you can look for. Interview them. You know, find out what they're you, – you have every right, just like – Actually, you have a little more choice than you do with your oncologist, right, because you're in a city and probably the closest hospital you picked from that team. But shop it a little bit. Um, talk to them. Do you get a good vibe off them? Is it somebody you kind of, first of all, do you think your child will, will interact with this person? Um, you know, usually everyone does that for free at consultation. Sometimes it's phone, face-to-face. -face. Um, ask, do you have any experience with kids who have had you know, illnesses. Um, and they may not, but they may have done trauma. They may do other complementary things. They may be a fabulous play therapist, and a fabulous play therapist can take, you know, the topic and work that through. Um, there are certification agencies for that. You can look up a directory of play therapists. Um, there, that is a, its own accreditation. You can go through um, recommendations. And even more so, go through, use your, um, use your treatment center. Talk to your social worker or psychologist at the treatment center and we try to network in the community with people. Now, we, you know, for example, here in Atlanta, we serve such a huge catchment area. I don't know individual therapists, you know, in North Carolina who, who do that. Um, but sometimes we know how to search that or around the, or maybe coincides with your clinic appointments. If there's somebody real good near the hospital, that you can, they can say, you know, when you're in town for your monthly visit, check in with this therapist and see if, if that's helpful. So I think the overall thing in this is control, right? Yes. A lot of kids get control by telling their story and shaping it. Others get control by saying, oh, I'm not talking about it. Um, so I think if we recognize that the motivation is control, can we give them control over that? Sure. Um, and you know what? Some people don't need to talk about it. Right. Right. I mean, that's, that's the other thing. I think it's we worry about the kids who really need that, that outlet or, or don't have the space to do that. Um, if he's cooking along and life is good, you leave yourself open to say, you know, here we are. And it may flash at times. Follow-up visits. How old's your child? Um, I think kind of giving a lot of the same. And, again, the, the, when they ask me to do siblings and patients, it's really hard to fit that in in 40 minutes and 45 minutes. So I apologize. I, I short-shifted as usual as siblings get short-shifted. Um, but a lot of these, the same tips apply to siblings, you know, giving space to do that. Um, I think giving, again, giving some praise and not, I cringed. We had a new family come in for assessment, and I just was making me my, my knee jerk because this mom just kept saying over and over again, this is our little donor. This is our little donor. And I'm like, no, that's your son. You know, that's, that's the brother. That's your son. Like, just stop calling him the donor. Um, like, let's let, let him have his own identity. So part of it is to say you did a fabulous thing. 
you did, look what you're a superhero, what you did, but not shove that down his throat. You know, because he, he didn't want to be different either. He wants to be normal. Everybody wants to be normal at the end of this. And he'll have space for that. And, um, you know, my cynical side of me is tell them all to write about this experience for the college essays. They'll get in anywhere. The admission officer will cry. Tell him to write the I was a I was a superhero essay and you know, and maybe he'll have the chance to do that, but an admission officer can't put that down or or your patient, oh, I was just talking to a, to a kid who was getting ready. He uh, just finished transplant. I'm like, let me tell you, admission officers love that story, you know. I had a bone marrow transplant. You'll get in. Except college admissions, right, but let's do that. So you know, I think we're not, there is no, like, remediation post-treatment. The, the closest thing is we have to look at, I actually started my career in acquired brain injuries in pediatrics. And that is, you know, it's, it's very much the same. So the strategies that we have to use are from the brain injury community. So the resources to tap into on that are probably more likely, you know, these are, this is my, my, little brain tumor patients I remember in teaching. I used to do, like, life skills with brain tumor patients. Um, it's really taking those very acquired disabilities. So it's kind of, it's going to be a little mix and match. A, a good neuropsych test every three years would be the gold standard for a child who's got that. And you're right, late effects from radiation for cognitive, neurocognitive, or interthecal chemo, we usually see about two years out. It takes about two years to see the effect of that. So when we talk about late effects, we really are doing that. We're seeing them later. So checking in that development. I think the partnership would be somehow connecting into your local brain injury community. And that could be from is there uh, outpatient rehab services offered in your city that knows that system well. Um, it's it's going to be cobbling together services. Um, there are cognitive rehab programs out there. They're smaller. They're mostly in the adult world, but there are some pediatric ones. Um, this particular state, Georgia, is woefully lacking in, in those kind of resources, but when I was in Washington, D.C., that was a resource that we could tap into. So it's going to be looking around there. It's going to be finding some creative educators in your school system. Um, and middle school are very difficult years, I find, for acquired brain injury kids in schools or acquired learning disabled. For some reason, there's, there's usually you get some dynamos in elementary school. And then again, when they get into high school, you can find educators with good strategies or you can tap into a broader resource within your school system. A good educational advocate helps. Most um, school systems and places do have advocacy agencies that are attached, um, the state is called the Learning Resource Center, um, and part of that would be sort of networking, again, through the brain injury community, through the special education, the broad umbrella of special education community. Um, do you have a parent-to-parent -parent program in the state? Because really, then you're moving into, and this is kind of a hard thing for us, we've got, we've, we're so immersed in the HEMONC world, and the BMT world, that when you get to that point where you have those specific acquired disabilities, you really need to reach into the developmental disability community. They're going to be the ones who have more of that knowledge, and it's a whole other system than we've been into an acute, acute survival. Um, you know, and somebody asked previously, like, why with survivors is they're not comprehensive? Because 30 years ago, we didn't have survivors out 25 years. You know, the, the remarkable thing is in the last 15 years, we have some of the first crops of survivors who are 40 and 50 years old. Now we have tons of them moving through, but only now are we seeing, well, what happens when they're 40? They were treated when they were five, so we had to wait 35 years to study them. So we're still on the infancy of survivorship. So I think it's garnering the strength, particularly with things like that, with memory. There are very specific strategies used in the rehab community for acquired brain injury for kids with specific memory problems and things like that and working very specific IEPs. Um, a lot of schools are not creative and you need, if you get an outside advocate who can design your plan, they can help make that happen in the school, but they're not necessarily going to come up with that. 
um, the good neuro, a good neuropsychologist in your community might, who works in that community or works with kids with acquired brain injury and tests them all might know the resources within that. It may be in a neighboring school district. It may be petitioning the school to say, I can't be met in the public school, but there's this great private school, and by law, if you can't meet my child's needs, you have to pay tuition at the private school. Um, that, is a, that is a federal law. Uh, hard to, you got to fight it. But there are advocacy agencies. So I would strongly suggest you network with the developmental disability community. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.